Good morning, everyone. A very warm welcome to Brunel University's online platform to attend this masterclass on working with known academic stakeholders. So before I go into the, the, the details of the program, may I uh, 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 introduce a couple of brief uh, uh, guidance notes for all of us. Uh, as you know, Brunel University London, we have started our research festival of, of this year, this week. And uh, we have some excellent series of stimulating discussions on different research areas and also working together for innovation with the different actors, uh, academic and known academic stakeholders. So uh, coming in, in, in particular uh, to, to this, this, this uh, uh, masterclass, so you know, we are using team, uh, a virtual platform. So if you are not a speaker or a panelist, may I request you to switch off the video or audio function of, of team. Uh, so I'm sure this will also help us to minimize some social anxiety, especially when some of us are still coming out you know, uh, in the morning and see mm, uh, how we look like, <laughs> or how am I looking like now? So, and, and if you're an invited speaker, please may I request you to activate your video when you speak and other times as you wish. And, and again, uh, coming to in, in particular uh, a part of uh, uh, this this masterclass, as you see in a brilliant, we, we, we have we, we, this last two weeks been quite a, a proud moment for us in Brunel because we have been ranked as the 53rd most impactful university in the world. That's out of around uh, 1,400 universities being ranked, and in the UK we are 13th from the top. So again, in this context, you know the the the, the role of higher education institutions and also the, the, the way higher education institutions engage with different stakeholders play an important role. Most higher education institutions, as you see, would express our vision in, in, in a very beautiful statement. Stakeholders are empowered by the sharing of knowledge and experience. Uh, and, and it is true, we, we, we try to, to fulfill this vision. Uh, and, and, and of course, we know, you know there, are, there are challenges in it. And, and uh, I was very, very briefly going through some of the some of the literature related to what are the ways to engage with different stakeholders for a higher education institution. So there are some recommended measures, especially the one you see on your screen is from International Association of Public Participation. So they recommend you know, this uh, information sharing process, consultation with different stakeholders, involvement, collaboration, and empowerment. This is going very high. You know, it's not just having sharing information alone, but if you look into this, this five areas of recommended measures, we could see, is, is that easy? To what extent it's achievable for us? Not sure, as you see the, the person, the, the, the virtual avatar sitting on this big question mark. Yes, we all face that uh, in our in our day-to-day -day, uh, work here and also outside the work context as well. So to, to discuss some of these issues, so we have planned this masterclass uh, to better understand the factors that lead to successful stakeholder partnership. And we are trying to see this in the context of national health services, with the local authority, research funding bodies, both public and private, in particular here with the trust, and then with the business organizations and universities for research and innovation. Again, we understand there are challenges, so we will also look in, in detail what are the challenges in developing research and innovation partnerships with known academic stakeholders and what are the measures to minimize them. And in detail, we will also discuss some of the selected examples of ongoing known academic stakeholder partnerships we have here in Brunel with uh, our academic experts working with their, their stakeholders and we will discuss these three successful case studies from, from different sectors. So now coming in, 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 in detail, the way we have structured this program. So, 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 so you, you'll find the, how we have structured. So I didn't introduce myself. So I am the business development manager here in Brunel. Uh, and also I, I manage uh, uh, a program to, to strengthen collaboration between non-academic stakeholders that we call Research, Innovate and Emerge, RIME. So I'm part of the Research Support and Development Office, which is the central uh, capacity of university here to, to facilitate research innovation partnerships and other support processes. And then 
we are actually having a keynote uh, 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 presentation by uh, uh, Professor Christina Victor. Uh, so, and then we will go into the, the, the details of the three successful case studies we are going to discuss. So we have uh, Dr. Dan Bishop and, and uh, uh, Benjamin Smith uh, and then Ian. And then we have Dr. Gabriela Spinelli, uh, Amy uh, Butterworth Fernandez, uh, 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 talking about sharing the experience of working with uh, with NHS. And then finally, we have Dr. Ronald McCarthy, Dr. David Corcoran, and Dr. Matthew Cummings, sharing the experience of working with businesses and university. So, so, so this is the way we have structured our program. And coming to 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 the main uh, keynote here, led by Professor Christina Victor. So, Professor Victor is a pro, uh, is, is specializing in, in gerontology and, and public health, and she is a fellow of the Faculty of Public Health. Her research interests are focused on aging and later life, and she leads the aging studies research at Brunel. She champions engagement process in Brunel. That's why we are here <clears throat> and leads Brunel's Older People's Resource Group Board, which is in existence over 12 years and would continue to thrive. And also, she has a passion for swimming. So if you need any yeah. further tips on swimming, you know where to ask for. Christina, the yeah. floor is Thank you. Good. Right. I hope everybody can uh, see my slides. <clears throat> I think keynote is probably uh, to overpromise for my... In I, I, I saw it more as some introductory remarks. And the context for our our uh, masterclass today is, as Michael has already said, the the focus and almost the ethos and the sort of lifeblood of of research at Brunel is very much around impact and making a difference for uh, different populations and different parts of parts of the world. And I think our our commitment to impact. And um, and in order to do that, the engagement that, that the gate, the, <clears throat> the engagement that underpins the ability to create impact is is our is our uh, very strong commitment to applied research and to do research that's of benefit to society. My colleagues at Brunel will be bored witless because I say this all the time, but our in in our 1966 charter, that uh, the university was uh, given when we were given university status. So the benefit of the, the, the mission of Brunel University is to conduct research that's of benefit to society. And I think we can see that in the rankings that Michael was referring to earlier. We are you know, not, not quite in the top 10, but very close to the top 10 most impactful universities in, in the UK, which is a very, very, very good achievement. And I'm, for the university folks in the audience, we will be getting the ref results on Friday. And I'm very hopeful that um, that we, our work will be recognised by good scores in impact. But this engagement doesn't, um, doesn't happen by itself. And when we're thinking about developing research, it's important to talk to the stakeholders who matter for that particular area of research. And over this last academic year, I've been um, leading with, with various colleagues a number of masterclasses, one which was around working with the public, which is you can see on the screen there. That can be uh, user groups, it can be particular demographic groups, or it can be a particular patients or users. Um, obviously, we we collaborate a lot with our fellow academics, but the, we'll ignore we'll ignore those for for to, for today. We also had a session on policy, working with policymakers, because again, particularly in thing in in certain areas, particularly perhaps around health engagement with policymakers and practitioners, is really important. And for Brunel colleagues, um, those recordings are are available online. But then we have this group that for want of a better term, and there is now a prize to be awarded for the term that can encompass the other engagement groups, the other groups it's really important to work with, 
people in the public sector, be that voluntary or charitable groups, so the local councils, um, in my own case, for my own research, the Alzheimer's Society and the various um, NHS, social care, education bodies and industry and enterprise. And as I was saying before we started, I'm slightly embarrassed that the title for this is non-academic uh, stakeholders. But so there is a prize. I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is yet. But, um, for somebody who can come up with the term that encapsulates those different parts of the uh, sectors that we need to, um, that it's very important for us um, to work with. So this is the, and I'll, can, can I move this on? Yeah. yeah. So I guess for us as, as researchers, I think it's important in the title, that you can see in the title, this is about collaborative research and innovation. And we can do, and I think there are a number of different reasons why we want to do it. And I don't want to go into too much detail, but, and there are, as Michael said, different models of involvement. So some studies may just, uh, no, it is appropriate for the topic and the um, relationship perhaps to do consultative engagement. But after a long partnership or relationship where parties come to know and trust each other, there can be more active um, kinds of engagement where perhaps collaborators are, act as co-researchers, analysts, and you can see this particularly in the public engagement, uh, working with public user groups where often um, in my own case, older people, but other other groups take a very active role in being researchers in helping with the analysis. So I don't want to frighten you off thinking we're going to have to learn to do grounded theory or structural equation modeling. But there are just different models and of collaboration between us and our partners outside, and we we vary them in in accordance with the questions that we're interested in. I think there are really four key reasons why why collaborative research with our various stakeholders is important. One of which is to give credibility and relevance to the questions that we want to ask. If I was left on my own in a darkened room to research what I liked, it would be a very narrow and rather niche activity, probably of no relevance to anybody. So it's really important that we talk to the relevant um, engagement and collaborative partners early on. What are the questions? I might think I know what the question is, but I almost certainly don't, or I don't understand the nuances of it. And so engagement keeps our research relevant and, and authentic. I think engagement helps us in terms of um, maintaining the quality of our work and uh, helps, up, helps us collaboratively to do better quality work. Um, obviously, collaboration is really important if we want to um, get the views of workers, consumers, um, other parties. So it, we definitely have better research by, by collaborating. And then, of course, um, when we come to the implementation phase, it's, it's extremely important that we have good relationships with partners to get access to researchers, but also for feeding back um, our, re our research results and getting um, insights from people who are actually going to use the research um, on, on how our, our findings look. Do they, do they seem to be um, sensible? And then I think one of the things that's really exciting and I would I like to see more of is the involvement in our collaborative partners in dissemination and impact. So one of the models on a dementia project I I work um, that I'm working on is that we have people with dementia writing papers with us, and we have people with dementia writing podcasts about their um, producing podcasts about their involvement in research and presenting academic papers. And I think. That would be really interesting if we could draw in wider groups of stakeholders to take part in that sort of dissemination activity so, so that the research and the findings get um, 
uh, oh, I'm going to say disseminated, but there ought to be a better word, uh, widely uh, dispersed across the different uh, communities. So I think I'll stop there. That must be my time up and hand back to Michael. Thank you, Christina, for that excellent start. <clears throat> so now, so we are going into the, 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 the main part of our, uh, our our discussions. So the first part uh, is, is led by, uh, you know, uh, our, our uh, the focusing on managing partnership to design and deliver deliver a video based immersive training intervention to young children. With this partnership is with London Borough of Hillingdon, where Ronald University is located, <clears throat> the Bikeability Trust, the funding organization, and Brunel University. So presentation is by Dr. Dan Bishop, who is a senior lecturer in sport, health and exercise sciences, and he's the academic lead for this program. Then Mr. Benjamin Smith, the director of development at the Bikeability Trust. Then we have Mr. Ian Ramsey, Hillington Cycle Support Officer here in the Hillington Council. And, and when our speakers speak, may I use you, uh, all the audience, please use the, the, the Q&A function to ask your questions. And then we will have uh, it's some immediate clarifications from the speakers for the first couple of, couple of minutes. And then we'll have a proper discussion once every speaker has completed the, the presentation. Now over to Dan and team. Okay, thank you, Michael. Can I confirm that I'm sharing my screen? Yep, fabulous. Uh, so, Michael, you did some of my work for me, uh, so I won't repeat that information. Um, but uh, as you pointed out, I, I'm the lead for this particular initiative here at Brunel. Um, and a, a few years ago, I did some soul searching as an academic. We've uh, been required for some time now to demonstrate impact in our work. And uh, I looked at my own strengths and those of uh, my research group. And we've uh, focused a lot on attention and perception and cognition in dynamic sporting context for the most part, also in motor learning. And I realized I could not only draw on that, but also draw on my experience as a commuter cyclist. And so it was pre-COVID when I started to think about how my research that I've done up to this point could have some impact out in the real world. And I identified the Bikeability Trust as a potential external collaborator in that regard. Um, for what will become obvious reasons, because um, as you'll hear from Benjamin very shortly, they have oversight of uh, the delivery of cycle training right across England. Um, so there are considerable numbers of children and sometimes adults who undertake bikeability training every year. And um, I, I thought there was a, an opportunity to add my psychological expertise to what they already deliver. Another collaborator um, I identified was our local authority as well, because they, along with training providers up and down the country, offer bikeability training to youngsters and to adults on a weekly basis throughout the course of each and every year. Um, this slide you can see in front of you, for me, really illustrates just how collaborative it's been. So we've got um, our LEAP Lab team, as I called it, and LEAP stands for Learning Expertise, Action and Perception, and the Bikeability Trust, and of course, Hillingdon Council, not least Ian, who will be speaking very shortly as well. Um, but I, I should make a nod to our colleagues in the Research Support and Development Office, and maybe more specifically to Bell Goman. Um, so just to add a bit of context to the, the project we're going to be talking about, which was funded by the Road Safety Trust, um, Bell and I started to have conversations pre-COVID about immersive training and immersive spaces at Brunel. And th these are on the increase, so interest in these is certainly on the increase. Um, and as part of our Leap Lab activities, we've done quite a lot of uh, immersive studies in which we've asked uh, people to watch naturalistic real world footage and then respond to that footage, footage in some way, shape or form. And I, part of Bell's remit was to um, look at how we can improve the uh, immersive offer at Brunel. So he and I started having these conversations and I, I mentioned my, my cycling idea and my vision for bikeology which um, now has a website and it has a social media presence and uh, we seem to be gaining some traction with the help of some much younger research assistants who are far more social media savvy. One of those is Tamara Dekadek, who's pictured top left there. She is uh, mine and my colleague David Broadbent's doctoral researcher at the moment. And incidentally, Tamara's research is focused on the um, 
cognitive benefits of cycling. So this clearly dovetails with what we're doing here. And um, so Bell ended up getting in touch with um, the Bikeability Trust, that's Emily Cherry, you can see there at the top right hand side, and Benjamin, who's with us today, the Director of um, Development of the Bikeability Trust, and also with Hennington Council, specifically with Ian Ramsey, who is our Cycle Support Officer. Um, and so then a journey began that's uh, nearly two years in the making from when I first uh, started to put together the application for the Road Safety Trust Fund. And uh, we'll come back to it, but uh, I'm now funded by the Bikeability Trust and DFT, or rather my research project is, um, as a result of the success we had with our Road Safety Trust funded project. And you can see the image dead centre of this slide, and that um, gives you a snapshot of, of what we did. But I'm mindful I've been talking for nearly four minutes. I set myself a timer. So I'd like to hand over to Benjamin, I think, to begin with, if that's... OK, great. Thank um, you. Um, I'll, you I'll mute. mute. Great, thanks. OK, so yeah, uh, my name is Benjamin Smith, the Director of Development for the Bikeability Trust. So um, we are responsible, as Dan said, for the administration of cycle training for children and adults in, in England uh, using the Bikeability Programme, which hopefully some of you have heard of before. The Bikeability Programme is 15 years old um, this year. Um, and when we work on behalf of the DFT um, and our vision in, in a nutshell is that we want more people cycling more safely and more often um, active travel uh, whether it's cycling or walking or, um, is uh, so important for so many reasons with, with global and individual or many global and individual health um, or, or which benefits um, and we, we, we need to make sure that we can offer um, cycle training or the, uh, to anyone who wants it by 2025, which is a stated ambition in, in the PM's gear change policy from a year and a half ago. So that's, I guess, a very small amount of background and vision. Now, there are, there are some challenges that we face uh, one of that being the reach um, we are uh, we are funded by dft but funding only goes a certain um uh, only a certain reach so for this year we should reach about 60 percent of children in year six with practical training which we call our level two training which is an eight hour intervention um which takes place on roads local to schools um now uh, so so that, that reach is limited due to the funding. Uh, the range as well as I've just uh, mentioned is is limited. Uh, we're funded to deliver the sort of that that snapshot and that's all. Now, of course, that snapshot of funding uh, um, and training does have an impact uh, and we've evidenced this uh, in, in, in previous papers. But again, that's clearly limited um, in, 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 in with just that one time intervention. Uh, and we also have another challenge in, in staffing this that the, the role does suit uh, individuals who are um, perhaps um, semi-retired or able to work really flexibly and, um, and, and in today's um, sort of, uh, um, employment context that the individuals like this uh, are, are quite hard to come by. So we have this challenge as well and um, I hope just as you get to understand the project a little bit more you'll, you'll understand how this project addresses all of these uh, challenges so well. I just want to take a quick moment to say why this relationship kind of has worked or why I think it's worked and Dan has mentioned several of the people involved and I think uh, one of the key reasons is because of of the people involved the passion the energy the professionalism of the Brunel staff so uh, Bao, uh, Dan and Tamara and of course Ian um, who you hear from in a moment who's a training provider who's done um, a lot of the uh, groundwork and legwork uh, with with Dan as well on on the ground and we've invested time and energy in the relationship and I think there's a lot of uh, mutual respect and a very much a shared passion as well but it, it was timely this project came about at just the right time as I mentioned we're looking to meet the gear change policy ambitions uh, and and this project does address the key challenges that we that we have because it does uh, significantly increase the reach of the program uh, it answers uh, recruitment and it's an additional piece of training that can um, uh, um, add to sort of the, um, uh, the 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 kind of the, the impact that practical training has, uh, and and in fact go 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 beyond 
uh, the impacts that the, the current training has, it, it, the, the, the first bit of research um, uh, evidence that immersive reality training for cycling was incredibly impactful um, and, and those who had immersive reality or training in the lab setup are, um, outperformed those who had um, uh, practical, practical training. Um, uh, and as an organisation, we love monitoring data, research, everything we want to do, we want it to be um, at its best and be informed by accurate and current research, which again, is why we, we, we jumped on this opportunity. Um, and it's also been a direction we've been thinking about for a little while, again, because of lack of uh, the time, time and expertise uh, internally. It's been brilliant to work with, with Dan and the team. So briefly on the benefits, um, We've got so much data now, which informs confident decision making as we uh, shape the program for the next uh, for the next um, uh, phase uh, of cycle training uh, in England. Um, we've been able to uh, answer a very key, clear question about is this effective, and the answer is a resounding yes. Um, and and what we end up with is, with is a program that's been formed collaboratively, which is something sort of better than we could have created on our own. And there's also an effect on sort of our long long term ambitions. Immersive virtual reality has given us a massive opportunity to scale up um, and uh, all very, very easily. Um, it's given us opportunity to meet policy ambitions as we work with Dan on the next part uh, of it to shape, create, uh, pilot and evaluate the offer even further. Um, and and I think there's like implications for wider projects, so other road users, drivers relating to uh, or experiencing what it's like to share roads with vulnerable road users in, in an immersive reality setting. Uh, thinking about e-scooters, uh, e-cycles, and any other form of cycle. So the the scope and the opportunity here are massive. And I realise I've uh, just gone over my five minutes, so I'm going to just pause right here and hand over to Ian. Thanks, Benjamin. Over to you, Ian. Hi, yeah. Um, I just thought I'd um, quickly cover some points that Benjamin had alluded to. So uh, again, just to confirm, bikeability is a national standard for cycle training. Uh, has three elements, uh, level one, two and three. Um, we normally deliver level one and two to primary schools, year six specifically, and it's basically a chance um, for them to prepare to cycle on the roads if they want to for when they are transferring to secondary schools. Um, which also aids to traffic mode shift, reducing congestion, the helping environment and the health, just to name a few. Um, training is delivered um, generally to groups of year six pupils um, at the roadside. So actually in the road with real life experiences. So um, we had this chance to get involved from the start of the research study. Um, and I'd like to think to help guide Dan and his team with the elements of bikeability training. Um, giving them the, a full understanding as to um, the results that could be recorded accurately from what's being trained to young people in the country. Um, it involved help second, setting up the whole process, really, I think, Dan, from uh, where we was going to snapshot certain instances um, to, re to help record and replicate the uh, four core functions required for each outcome that's delivered under the training program. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So the pupils performances were, were studied at various snapshot times um, through uh, online videos similar to like hazard perceptions. Um, some children were brought into the lab, so the lab was actually set up um, again, on a concept from from Dan's vision as to what he wanted to achieve. Um, so, so the environment was set up, although it was a static bike with three screens, it, the whole video process and experience was again aligned to um, capturing. The pupil or the young person's performance that included head movement, looking behind um, control of the static bike, or that was static um, and observing which is a key thing, top function for cycle, cycling and cycle training. Um, this in turn progressed to how was we going to snapshot the pupils performance throughout the whole process. Um, again, it was for pupils that have already received cycle training through bikeability. Um, 
but it was also then materialised to include how much retention that young people had following receiving the training. So various elect times were taking place, snapshots were taken, and we even did some on-road one-to-one assessments with all the pupils that took part. Um, this involved a, 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 stat, a, a, a route that covered various junctions. Um, and at the end of each assessment ride, we created again a, another document to, to confirm what they were doing often, what they were not doing very often, um, which was again accurate data for um, the results for the study process. Um, the online videos were quite interesting as well. Spent many hours with with Dan going through what did we want to ask questions on regarding the online videos, um, even to the point of how many people were walking on the left. So for observation purposes, which is again, which is the one of the top core functions for cycle training. Um, Ian, sorry yes. to cut you short. I'm mindful of the time. You, okay, we always had limited time for this. So I, I think I'd better wrap things up um, by saying, so this was an immersive training project. And as Benjamin and Ian both pointed out, we had some children come into our lab and they can they were doing what you can see in the slide there. That's actually my son Toby sitting in this immersive uh, setup. And then they were tested out on the roads with local instructors and compared to a control group that didn't do our training, they considerably outperformed them. Why is this relevant? because this may be a fantastic way for the Bikeability Trust to be able to offer some form of cycle training to every child in England um, by 2025, because it can be done quickly and easily. And I'd just like to wrap up by saying, we've taken things on a step with the, the latest funded project, and I'm sitting at the moment in a partner school here in Hillingdon, and we have just presented to year nine pupils in their assembly, 300 of them, and we're hoping to get years seven, eight, and nine children coming in doing something with a VR headset in this very room I'm in now. I could even turn my surface round and show you our setup and my colleague David, but I won't. Um, and this is very exciting. And I, I'm hoping that we will get children enthused about cycling because in this particular age group, the enthusiasm tends to wane. But not only that, once they are out there cycling, that they're safer. And the evidence would suggest from this first project you can see in front of you that we were very successful first time around. And I'm hoping we'll see the same again with this very brief intervention, whereby the children are going to be viewing about 15 minutes worth of footage only. So if we can increase enthusiasm for cycling and improve cycling safety by such brief interventions, you can see how the outreach of the Bikeability Trust can be extended significantly. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Dan and team, so you, you started to answer the question that I was going to ask, to what degree it would be possible in theory to roll out this intervention into schools. So you've partly answered that, but who, if we wanted to scale it up like that, what's the kind of, what's the cost for the school involved? And could teachers do this? Does it need cycling enthusiasts? I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a reluctant cyclist. So is it scalable? Yeah, uh, so yes is the short answer to that. And I yeah. even have a figure for you for the cost. It's four to five thousand pounds doing it with the setup that we have here, not yeah. what you've seen there. And it doesn't require as much space as what you saw on the slide there. Um, and teachers can do it because I, well, this is what I'm I'm hoping to do in the future, which is to um, help training providers and stakeholders to roll it out for end users such that yeah they can be autonomous and not require too much in the way of expert input from academics like me. And uh, again, as a and and a rather reluctant cyclist, does the uh, the video footage vary according to the kind of environment where the school is? So if you were doing it in I don't know Dorking or somewhere where you've got narrow lanes and fast drivers is, is do, you, do you have different training materials according to the context or is it is it the same that is an excellent question it feels as if you've got some kind of insights i wasn't aware of not not um, really <laughs> okay no that's very good yeah that's that's a very pertinent question um 
So when I uh, acquired the video footage for, well, the previous project and this one, I, I went out on the roads myself with a 360 degree camera. And for this VR headset setup, I did it uh, using a recumbent cycle. My intention is that training providers up and down the country with or without my assistance can acquire footage in their local areas yeah. so that the children can be trained on the roads in, that they will be using. And that's exactly what we did for the, the project with Ian. We went out and we filmed routes that go past primary schools in the borough. So these children were familiar with the roads and would ideally be using them. Yeah, it's a very important point. Yeah. There's so much we could say that we can't fit into this time yeah, no, slot, no, no, of no, course. No, I appreciate yeah. that. But, yeah, thank you for filling in that gap, Christina. Yeah, no, so it seems actually quite a, 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 a sort of um, intervention with a lot of potential. You can, you've got a core set of principles, but you can customise it to the location. Which, yes, which yeah. seems really good. Yeah. yeah, it really does. And the, the observable changes in behaviour from a brief intervention were really profound and I expect them to be profound with this. It's very exciting. Mm. And presumably it's customised to meet the standards of whatever, you know, bikeability level one. Yes, again, yeah. it's hard to do justice to everything that's been going on in this very yeah, short no, slot. No, but no, Ian no. has been amazing and took the research project to another level. That's no exaggeration. And bike, um, well, Benjamin at the Bikeability Trust and Emily Cherry, the director and their colleagues, they've been hugely supportive at every step as well. To the point where we, we even came up with an innovative way of doing the on-road assessment uh, with a particular checklist that assesses these four core functions that Ian referred to, which are the, the ways in which the, the Bikeability Trust asks instructors to assess children in terms of their position on the road, their communication, their understanding of priorities, um, and their, would run this out, communication, did I already say that? <laughs> position priorities. I might do the course, but I don't think it will solve yeah. my problems with trying to balance on my bike. Yes, of course. Yeah. Observation. I missed the most important one, which is <laughs> what I was focused on. The fourth core function is observation. It's looking around. Yeah. 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 I'll stop talking now for the sake yeah, of It's okay. Very briefly, I know uh, we have already taken more time, but it's all fascinating yeah. subject in terms of Ian and, and, and Benjamin, your perspective. Where do you, where, how did you see or in terms of decision making with the you know, local council that this is going to you know, be part of your plan or Benjamin again, where did you see that, you know, this is what going to be something priority for the trust? So that decision making process of engagement, if I, very briefly, please. Yeah, I mean, obviously we we work with the DFT to um, um, uh, to sort of make decisions, but I think um, we've touched on how it how it how it's so scalable. Um, it, it's almost it's it, for me it's a no brainer. It's so scalable. It's so much more cost effective um, than <coughs> than the, the current program, um, and it's so exciting. Uh, so I think as as Dan brief brief briefly said uh, there are challenges to, to working with older children uh, as cycling gets sort of less interesting um, uh, where, where you can introduce this element which which is um, uh, yeah very very appealing um, which will then again hopefully lead on to uh, more sort of training um, practical training and cycling in in practice so I think that it, it's, it's an incredibly appealing thing um, and we can make it scalable we can uh, uh, provide literally everything that the local authority needs um, to, to to roll it out and a package that schools or, or our training providers can can work with. I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just see it as, as what I would term as more as a near as the actual training on road that we do. Um, it allows young people to have that experience in a in an environment mm -hmm. that's not on the road um i think also opens up the other other opportunities of we've referred to it as cycling but you know i think it's going to could be adaptable to um pedestrian training for example um to maybe even give experiences to those people with send conditions um you know it it, it could just although we've got a bike in the middle of the of the setup you could put anything in the middle with the yeah. the technology that we've got. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Yeah, very good point here. Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 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 yes, Dan, Benjamin, and and yeah. Ian. I uh, really appreciate. Uh, yes, that that sharing of excellent, uh, yeah, insights. So the next presentation is um, by. Dr. Gabriela Spinelli, 
reader uh, in the Brunel Design School here, and uh, Amy Butterworth Fernandez, who is the Director of Sustainability at the Guys and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust. So their presentation is focusing on aiding NHS net zero strategy with sustainable hospital curtain, a partnership with with Guys mm -hmm. and St. Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust. Gabriela and Amy, over to you. Thank you, Michael. I hope you can see my screen. That has become now a standard question before presenting. Um, and thank you also for um, this possibility of uh, showcasing our work. So we decided to focus on the um, collaborations rather than the insights and the findings of the research, because we thought that perhaps the audience would be more interested in uh, why and how we started to work together. Um, so without further ado, I will start telling you a story about hospital curtains and why we became interested in them. So hospital curtains are a, an object of everyday life for NHS clinical staff and for patients and also for visitors and carers that visit uh, people staying in hospital. Um, they are... Um, made out of uh, 7.5 meters uh, or polypropylene and some have an antimicrobial coatings and some don't. So we started getting interested uh, in the usability of the curtains and here I mapped uh, the evolution of the research question that drove the collaborations with um, initially Hillenden Trust and then Guy and St Thomas. So we were interested in preserving the dignity of the patients because as you can see from this slide, they keep pulling it back uh, because they are pleated. Uh, they, kept, they keep pulling it back and also the hook that attached them to a railing uh, doesn't run smoothly and creates attritions, therefore exposing the patients. <clears throat> and also from a usability perspective, we were interested in how staff could maneuver uh, the curtains without having to dirty them because if they were uh, if they were wearing uh, gloves to attend to the patients uh, the guidelines says the nursing staff and um, um, healthcare clinical staff should not be touching the curtains but because they kept opening there was these continuous distractions of uh, having to keep the curtains closed in addition to that they don't communicate clearly that there is something going on in the cubicles and people should not peep in or enter without permission from, from a usability perspective, we then start uh, once we realize um, what we were dealing with and what products we were dealing with, what was the materials, how it was uh, generated, how it was, how it was made and how it was destroyed. We then started to develop an interest in the sustainability of the curtains and the impact that they had on the environment. We then start questioning what are the requirements and what is the balance of the requirements in the procuring of curtains in the NHS. And also what alternatives are there uh, currently in use in different NHS trust and potential also with management strategies in order to deal with curtains uh, in the view that the NHS is delivering or wish to deliver a net zero strategy um, for 2045. And then following the focus on sustainability, uh, other questions have been asked um, and therefore we attempted to answer. Uh, with a, a study on microbiology to compare the antimicrobial uh, property and performance uh, of curtains, um, both whether they are washable or disposable. And as you can see, the stakeholders have changed throughout uh, the project, starting from Laura, the head of nursing in oncology, and then moving on to Amy, uh, who is here with us today. Laura, unfortunately, couldn't make it. Uh, but Amy is here to talk about the system sustainability part of the project. And then moving on to actually the facility managers, uh, the um, Harefield Hospital and the matron in the cardiac ward where we are going to do an anti, um, a microbiology study. So what have we developed? And unfortunately for commercial um, sensitivity, I can't show you the final prototype, but we have developed a new system that includes a better closure for the curtains, better hooks that allow a, a, a better smooth, a smoother um, a sliding of the curtains on the rail. We have developed also better signage that uh, indicates um, that the curtains should not be open unless permission is given. 
And the closure is um, create a firm uh, barriers between the external environment and the bed cubicles. We call this system this, the new system Amelio, which means to improve. And um, you can see here uh, usability. Um, the results of the usability testing that we have done with around uh, 60 members of staff, um, ranging from clinical staff, consultant, nursing, health and safety, IPC. Um, and, um, and the comparison is quite uh, stark in terms of uh, the results. Um, we run this simulation, uh, the, these evaluation both in simulated wards as well as in two clinical wards. What we learned uh, was that the even for a simple product like, like uh, the, the hospital curtains, which represent the largest single use plastic product in the NHS, we had a complex ecosystem <clears throat> with four major um, components, the environment, business and people and technology. And we have an intersections of these components that lead to complex requirements and business function that all must be satisfied in order to have a product that is viable, sustainable and usable for all, um, for all involved. And I leave it to Amy now to discuss the sustainability part. Thank you, Gabriella. Hi, everybody, and thanks for having me today. I'm Amy, Sustainability Manager for the Guys and St. Thomas's Trust. I'll keep it quite brief, but thank you to uh, Gabriella and to Tim Boxall, who joined our a very small sustainability team at the Trust. Um, thanks to this Design Exchange Partnership, Tim has worked part time uh, for about six months in the team to basically assess viable, sustainable alternatives to the thousands of single use plastic curtains, uh, cubicle curtains that we use in the Trust every year. Uh, he went through a long process of identifying our key stakeholders and, and main suppliers of the cubicle curtains, and I guarantee that was no easy feat, uh, somewhere as complex as GSTT. Uh, and he, he calculated that the Trust buys enough single-use cubicle curtains to wrap the world in plastic each year, which scared me. Uh, that's based on a six-month lifespan, by the way. So during COVID-19, when curtains were changed more frequently, um, we could probably wrap the world several times over in, in plastic. Um, he mapped out the key stages and processes of the curtain life cycle uh, within the trust from manufacture to, to disposal. And then he conducted streamlined life cycle analyses for the different cubicle curtain systems. He also drew all of these pictures, which I think is quite amazing. Um, but they were used in staff engagement workshops uh, with, with a range of people to try and explain to people the complexity of the process, what happens with a curtain, where a curtain comes from and where it goes to. And it was really quite difficult to work out every step, given how many different curtain types we buy, uh, the different parties involved. Um, but the, ne the next slide also gives a bit of a summary of the outcome of the life cycle analyses that, that Tim conducted uh, to show you how each different curtain type product uh, performed against key criteria that he that he stated here. And so you'll see that uh, washable, reusable curtains scored very well in terms of financial and environmental cost. Um, so so these numbers were shared at the several workshops that that we held um, with, with the staff at the trust. Um, next slide, Gabriella, please. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, a range of staff attended, as Gabriella mentioned, it was most certainly not just the sustainability team. And although infection prevention and control, or IPC, seems to dictate our procurement decisions on, on cubicle curtains, even though as yet we've not seen evidence or data to sort of explain why that is, um, it was quite amazing to see that when attendees were asked the question, um, rank what is most important when it comes to, to buying curtains, sustainability came out on top. Um, so you'll see a range of other issues are important, but IPC is actually quite far down. Um, so that, that was very interesting for us. Next slide, please, Gabriella. Um, in terms of operational barriers, switching to a different curtain system, sadly, in practical terms, really isn't a simple switch. We use thousands, there's lots of people uh, involved in the process and we think that the that this was the outcome again from from staff when we asked them, laundry logistics would possibly be the most complicated 
barrier that we need to overcome simply because where do you where do you put all those curtains that the reusable curtains where where do you store those how do you get them to the right place the right size for the right curtain rail etc etc so in practical terms it could be very difficult to switch but again ipc wasn't 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 um voted on as really really highly important in terms of an operational barrier so the next slide gives us a summary again of, of the many benefits that the partnership has brought to the trust um, and amy i could perhaps take over from you and summarize and you can feel, feel free to ask at any time so in these slides i wanted to summarize the takeaway from working together and perhaps what works what worked the best for the collaboration between Brunel and Gaines and Thomas. So first of all, the recognition that and, and the synergy between specific skill set. So understanding uh, design engineering, understanding um, sustainability, design for sustainability uh, from our side and from um, Amy's side and the trust side, understand policy, understanding who to speak to, understanding uh, what are the managerial framework and the procurement processes that the trust has to go through um, in order to make sure that um, we could fit in and provide um, a, a piece of work, a piece of research that was actually feasible and potentially um, impactful for the trust. The second, um, the second principle, if you like, that we respected was that of being inclusive in the participation uh, in the research and innovation process. We included around 80 people um, and they range from, as I mentioned before, health and safety all the way to managerial staff at pretty senior level for Gans and Thomas and Essentia, which is uh, the um, operation arm of, of the trust. Um, in terms of working principle, we had long term shared objectives that certainly were set both in the research proposal that we submitted and also uh, that we reminded ourselves as to why we were doing that. But also we had what Amy kept calling checking in every Monday, which worked very well for the team and they were just a short term a way of uh, checking that the activities were going according to plan and we were delivering um, against the objectives that we had. In terms of principle, um, we had a, a shared shared value with regards to a human-centred design perspective and also uh, being pro-environmental. And I think that also shown in the slides that um, Amy discussed about sustainability, be, sustainability being at the top of the priority for all um, member of staff that were involved in, in the workshops. Um, what also worked very well for us was to evaluate and co-design the research questions uh, so that they could be relevant in terms of academic positioning but most importantly impactful for the trust not only for the trust but for the nhs a large guy and thomas is the largest trust in the uk and now include five clinical units and uh, now that um, Royal Brompton and Harfield have joined the trust and therefore um, it represents for us a scaled down model of the whole NHS and why um, and, and, and that's why it's important for us to uh, make sure that the impact can be seen in that trust and potentially extended outside the NHS. And finally, uh, the overall um, influence that we want to exercise is that of um, creating awareness about alternative, um, creating awareness about the impact of products and systems and processes that are chosen currently by the NHS and potentially uh, drive the decision making in a different directions to make or to achieve a more balanced um, set of requirements when making choices about product system and services in the NHS. And with that, I stop. Excellent. Very interesting. So I, I wonder if you could just perhaps outline for us more a little bit more the next steps, because obviously this is a very big NHS trust, but how do we how do we influence what stakeholders, who do we need to talk to, what evidence do they want for in order to make a, a more um, change at a more uh, NHS level rather than Yes, yeah, so for us, the interest it goes in two directions. One, we, um, uh, I think, 
practically the procurement of the curtains in the trust is up for the tender is going to be um, redesigned and relaunched pretty soon. So we hope to contribute to the design so, of the So tender. each trust de decides what it wants to buy. Uh, okay, actually, I kind of thought it was a command and control. Actually, Christina, is every hospital. Oh, every hospital, okay. Yeah, so the, the diversity in practice is in part what creates the issue because there are no terms of references. Um, and everyone can decide whether they want to go washable, disposable, antimicrobial, non-antimicrobial, and so on and so forth. Even at the degree of antimicrobial, there is a difference in terms of uh, environmental impact. Some antimicrobial functionality are achieved through a coating, some are achieved by embedding silver in the thread of the fabrics, and they all have a different impact on the environmental, um, on the environment, so and waste management. So um, is the deferring practice that in part is what Amy referred to as not an easy fit task, you know, <laughs> to find out who, who do we procure it from, how do we get rid of them? Um, even identifying whether they were incinerated, whether we're put in a red bag, red plastic bag or white plastic bag, um, identifying from DEFRA what were the waste management guidelines for products that were not infectious. That has been per se um, a really complex um, a discovery process. So for now, for now, our um, impact in the short term will be to try to influence the, the tender that will come up again, Sir Thomas and also to understand a little bit more about the procurement process in general, single-use single, single use plastic products. For that, we have submitted another grant um, to try to find out whether we can extend the analysis that we've done for the, for the curtain system to other medical products, um, and what lessons that is learned here can be extended to, um, to other products. So you can imagine all the PPI that are used in the NHS are made of similar materials, so what can we do in order to uh, change the way we think about the choice we make? Um, there is a question from Anne, if you don't mind me taking that. Uh, the question says, have you had feedback from patients? Um, so patients are, uh, um, patients at the moment, we they don't actually close or open the curtains. What they want to have is uh, a barriers between themselves and the, their surrounding. Uh, we had, we didn't go out to collect patients' uh, feedback. You require a degree of ethical approval um, that, has, that takes substantial time. What we had informal feedback when we evaluated in clinical environment and patients were there and they told us, I like the way that the curtains close. Um, but we didn't go out of that. We, we didn't uh, focus on patients' feedback at this, this moment in time because they are not handling, so to speak, the curtains. Um, and I hope I respond uh, to your question, but um, we, we would be interested in uh, family and, um, and patients' feedback, but that is part of a process that has to allow for probably six months of an HRA uh, ethical approval, um, which is quite a considerable time. Um, that, that said, informally, we do know that lots of patients prefer reusable curtains because it doesn't feel like a clinical setting in the same way. So informally, we do hear of clinicians that say actually having reusable curtains that are printed or, you know, look more like a normal curtain instead of a plastic sheet, mm. give people a homely feel in some context. So, but we haven't officially done a study on that. Yeah. yeah. And that just highlights who are the stakeholders, who are the people we need to engage in at different parts of the, the, Absolutely. Of the research so process. One, yeah. one, of, one of the issues that um, was discovered was that washable curtains at the beginning were considered to be uh, not, not, not very well received by nursing staff because when you wash them high temperature, they shrink. And, and therefore, okay. hanging them becomes harder because they have a, a place for the, for the hook. Uh, actually, uh, these were the curtains of 20 years ago that were made out of simple co cotton, and they would shrink at 60 degrees and, and more. But um, washable curtains are not any longer made of that sort of materials, and they don't shrink to that degree any longer. Um, and the second point, which actually was highlighted in one of the bar charts that Amy discussed, um, was the logistic of delivering the right curtains to the right wards. Yeah. That seems to be a bit of a question mark. But um, 
logistic when it comes to um, laundering are already resolved when it comes to bed linen. So it doesn't seem to be a massive um, uh, add-on process that needs to be yeah. uh, reconsidered and redesigned uh, for the curtains. So there are some urban myth, if you like, when it comes to consider the, the complexity of change. And I, I appreciate that any organization, any individual uh, struggle with change at times. Um, but um, in, in terms of environmental impact, I'm not sure that we have any other choice but to change behaviours. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good point to, I think, conclude this this part of our uh, mm -hmm. our session. Thank you. That was I've learned. I never knew curtains were so complicated. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gabriella, yeah. Amy, Christina. <laughs> That's yes. Very insightful and yeah. opening up lots of questions, yeah. but I'm keeping them all here. Yeah, yeah. That's for a, a proper chat sometime later. So thank you. So the next presentation is done by trio uh, of Dr. Ronan McCarthy, who is a senior lecturer uh, here in Brunel in biosciences, and Dr. David Corcoran, who is the CEU, and Dr. Matthew Cummings, who is the Chief Operating Officer of the business organization CC Bio. And their presentation is focusing on how a business, in this case, CC Bio, and university partnership for the development of clinically translatable therapies for the treatment and prevention of bacterial vaginosis. Ronan, David, yeah. and Matthew, over to you. Thank you very much. Oh <coughs> Yeah, and yeah, sorry, just before we begin, Ronan, it's a it's a duo, I'm afraid. Uh, Matt is actually in the lab at the moment. So um so you'll you'll be stuck with me as as CC Bio's representative today. Perfect. I just want to check everybody can see the screen, okay? See the slides. Yep. Perfect. Excellent. So uh, ju just to start off and maybe give a, give a bit more of an introduction. So um, th this is quite an interesting story in terms of engaging with a startup company um, even before, let's say, the company was fully established, because this goes all the way back to uh, 2018 and a couple of, uh, I suppose, emails and cups of coffee that, that ultimately led to the formation of a company and the acquisition of um, um, some funding and also I think the the real development of a, a, a real potential um, new treatment for what is a very, very um, uh, prevalent condition, uh, bacterial vaginosis. So what, what we'll do throughout the course of the talk today is I'm going to pass over to David on the next slide and he's going to talk through from uh, CC Bio's perspective as a startup company, uh, what they were looking for in an academic collaborator and how they came to collaborate with Brunel. And then at the end of uh, his slides, I'll give a bit of an academic perspective on that in terms of what I've learned from collaborating with a startup company as it developed and uh, gaining uh, an insight into, uh, I suppose, how startup culture works and the hurdles that are involved in that. Um, so I'll pass over to you, David, if that's OK, yeah. and yeah, thanks, uh, go to the next slide. Yeah, so I guess as Ronan described, you know, back in 2018, uh, when we first uh, began what ultimately uh, ended up as a really fruitful collaboration, you know, uh, it was myself and Matthew who were, were beginning the process of founding a startup company. So most biotech startups um, traditionally spin out of universities. So, you know, an academic such as Ronan uh, does, some, does some research that is deemed commercially important or, or that has the potential to bring a commercial return. And they spin out, I guess, a private company uh, that typically the university which has the initial research will will have a stake in. So we uh, went, I guess, an alternate route, which is which is actually beginning to to become more common, where uh, an organisation uh, called Venture Creation Houses um, develop and build companies themselves without any input from universities. So our our um, Venture Creation House in this case was called Deep Science Ventures, and they're a London-based uh, Venture Creation House. And what they do is they take uh, PhD grads, such as myself, uh, I did my PhD at King's College London in medicinal chemistry, and Matthew, uh, who uh, did his PhD in Manchester in synthetic biology, and kind of put them in a room 
and give them kind of, I guess, topics of importance or that the venture creation house thinks uh, are areas where there, there's a need for, for commercial companies. So really what, what myself and Matthew's focus on was antimicrobial resistance and I guess uh, in, to a, a wider extent, the uh, human microbiome and how increasingly uh, the bugs and the, the content of bacteria in our gut or on our skin or in our vaginal environment affect, you know, the, the pathogenesis of potentially non-communicable diseases in addition to the standard infections that, that um, we're all aware of. So really at this point, uh, as we were, you know, um, I guess discussing ideas with one another, what we, what we wanted to do um, was to uh, approach young career researchers or I guess any researcher who, who would have time of day for us um, to, to understand what was important in the space, in the antimicrobial space and the microbiome space, kind of before we we uh, spun out the company from this venture creation house. So I guess if you can go on to the next slide there, Rana, that would be great. Um, yep. So really, that was when we first encountered Ronan. Uh, so Ronan was open-minded enough to uh, to get back to us when we reached out to him. Uh, it, it just kind of, I guess, asking him what what he felt was important and and what what would be a good space to collaborate. And really, at, at the end of that process, and at the end of I guess a bit more work by us with the venture creation house to pitch our case to them, uh, we incorporated as a company in November 2019 and. The, and the venture creation has invested about fifty thousand pounds in us, and we had a clear area of focus, and it was optimizing the vaginal microbiome uh, to promote uh, better prenatal health outcomes, especially in in the context of uh, bacterial vaginosis. So really at that point, what what we needed out of an academic collaboration and what we needed really as a company was was um, to uh, generate compelling proof of concept data to secure a follow on funding, because I suppose anyone who's worked in wet lab science will know that £50,000 is not a lot of money to do any sort of scientific research at all. And I think what was really important for us too to, to build our credibility as an organization was to build out our network of uh, key opinion leaders, as we call it in the business, but really just expert academics who kind of know what they're doing in the space and have, have background expertise. So, you know, at that time, uh, we couldn't offer too much. You know, we were we were a small, young company. But what I guess what we could offer was helping Brunel and its academics access Innovate UK funding where industrial partners were, were required. So Innovate UK is a government organisation. Um, I guess it, it, it's, uh, it's under the heading of, I think, user, U, uh, UK research. Um, and really, they, they offer grant funding to private companies um, where the goal really is commercializing a product and building value to the UK economy. And that can include academic partners, but these, these funding applications must be led by industrial partners. Uh, so I guess you can move on to the next slide, Ronan. So uh, how did we, so how did, how do we begin our collaboration with Brunel? So I think, and I think I'm really grateful to uh, Brunel's RSTO for this sort of uh, scheme. Uh, which was an innovation voucher, which helps us establish our collaboration in the first place. So as we began our discussions with Ronan and continued the, our discussions with Ronan, Ronan uh, drew our attention to this scheme offered by the RSDO of Brunel. Uh, and what this scheme involved, this innovation voucher involved, was uh, a £5,000 funding from Brunel University to help establish commercial collaborations at a very early stage. And this also included a £5,000 contribution from us. So really what, what the innovation voucher was about was kind of getting getting these collaborations off the ground. Yeah, because it, it's great, you know, often you speak to academics and you have you have lots in common, but if you don't get any money at all to do anything, it's very difficult to for the academic to prioritize uh, their their collaboration with you over their funded research. And that's that's completely understandable. So really with 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 this process, it allowed Ronan to devote a little bit more of his time to to building what he felt and what we felt was an important collaboration. So so what this innovation venture entailed was a large scale screen of plant derived materials against against some of the pathogens that that are linked to uh, bacterial vaginosis, which is which is a vaginal dysbiosis uh, leading to um, a number of prenatal health issues, including uh, preterm birth, uh, increased risk of preterm birth, increased risk of um, sexual health, uh, uh, sexually transmitted disease um, transmission and also uh, increased risk of miscarriage. Um, 
So we did this screen, uh, we had some, some promising hits and really the outcomes of that was it established our, collabor our collaborative relationship in a way that was more than just discussing cool ideas. Um, so yeah, uh, the, and, uh, and a really key important part of this innovation feature from our perspective as I guess an industrial stakeholder was that Brunel at this point uh, agreed that we would maintain the background IP of, of this project. And I think that's really important from, from our perspective uh, because really without our IP at this stage, we wouldn't really be too uh, valuable to investors. <clears throat> so yeah, if you could go to the next slide, Ron. So I think, I think, and the whole point of this talk is how one thing kind of leads to another if, if all parties are open-minded. And I guess the, the outcomes of this innovation venture and the results of this uh, innovation venture enabled us to, to submit an Innovate UK grant application together as a consortium. So after that innovation venture was complete and that screen was complete, we as a company discovered another class of microbiome therapeutics and we identified Innovate UK as a suitable funding body to help to help continue our development as a company. But what we again, what we required was, I guess, an academic partner to conduct some specialized testing of these therapeutics, because at this point we were still very resource strapped and, and didn't really have the facilities that, you know, you guys boast at Brunel. So given that we had an established relationship with, with Ronan, uh, we prioritized, in, uh, I guess, including him or inviting him to, to collaborate on this, on this application rather than some of the other academics at other London universities where we hadn't received such funding and such background data. So really, uh, as, so with the outcomes with this process was on the second attempt, uh, we managed to secure a £250,000 Innovate UK smart grant and £75,000 of that was directly allocated to Brunel. So that uh, grant commenced um, in February 2020, I believe, uh, which wasn't an ideal time to begin a uh, wet lab research grant. But I think it's, you know, it's a testament to all involved and I suppose uh, the life or health sciences department at Brunel um, that that we managed to actually complete this grant successfully uh, meeting all of our targets um, uh, and on on schedule so you know we're really grateful as a company that 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 was possible um, and um, a key part of that grant was that I think we managed to to bring knowledge into Brunel um, through this collaboration so it funded a visiting postdoctoral researcher for six months in in the McCarthy group from from a specialist uh, facility in Cork, which which specialises in the technology and the, the microbiome therapeutics that we were developing. So, so I'd like to feel that we brought more more expertise and knowledge to the to the McCarthy Group through this uh, collaboration. So, if you could go to the next slide, Ron. So, I guess the lessons learned from from our perspective, and I guess I can I can wrap up my views and and pass over to to Ronan after this. I think what's really important uh, from our perspective when we're dealing with with academic collaborators and universities is open mindedness. So, you know, sometimes it requires an element of trust. It requires an element of, of meeting us halfway, you know, um, and I think a really good example of that was the uh, was the innovation venture where we were able to keep that IP. Um, so so, you know, maybe some sometimes some upfront sacrifice on behalf of the university leads to longer term. Uh, success for everybody, and I think I think that manifested in in the Innovate UK grant that that we managed to to win both for ourselves and and uh, Brunel. I think cooperative spirit is important, um, especially when resources are tight. You know, we like where we can, we try to help out Ronan, and vice versa. Ronan's been really good to us in in the past um, on a number of fronts, whether that's strain provision uh, or or conducting some some research for on our behalf when when we have been unable to uh, given our resources. I think it's important always to think of the longer term outlook. Um, you know, at the time we, when when both Ronan decided to sit down with us for a cup of coffee uh, way back in 2018, or, you know, Theresa Waller at the, at the RSCO decided um, that an innovation venture would be suitable for, for our very, very preliminary project, uh, I guess, at the start of 2019. I think, I think that longer term outlook, again, 
uh, really was vindicated in the end when when we managed to build what has been quite a fruitful uh, partnership. So really, ultimately, building academic commercial collaboration does require a different approach than traditional academic academic partnerships. I guess everyone at Brudel is probably more familiar with the latter, but I would say increasingly um, there is there is revenue to be brought from from engaging with the industrial community and being open minded about how to do that in maybe a more non traditional way uh, is 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 important too. So I guess I guess that's probably. Uh, my views on on what's happened so i guess uh, i can pass on to ronan and he can wrap it up perfect thank you very much david so i'm just going to touch base then on a couple of uh, i suppose points from an academic perspective which i think are maybe uh, considerations that people have had or or um uh the feelings or thoughts people have had when it comes to collaborating with the industry particularly startup industry uh or startup companies but uh, i suppose over the last couple of years working with cc bio and working with david and matthew i've learned a huge amount of stuff that quite simply couldn't be taught on, on any kind of uh course and i suppose part of that is from actually having to do these things but one of the big things i think which turns academics off collaborating potentially with with industry is that a, a lot of times all the benefit is to the startup company or to the um uh to the more established company whatever you're talking about collaborating with and there's limited comeback then for for potentially the academic and particularly in the metrics that a lot of the time we're measured as academics by and and oftentimes i mean that's publications it's conferences it's these kind of things which um industry has an interest in but not to the same uh level or priority that an academic would have and i think from from the very beginning and i think probably it lends itself to the fact that david and matthew hadn't been too long out of the academic sphere themselves they were very clear that uh, we could match these targets so that they wanted to secure um, let's say patents I needed to secure publications and we were able to mutually help each other out when working towards these targets um, another aspect I think which was quite interesting was conveying across the importance of timelines and these kind of things because um, equally CC Bio as they were going through different stages of their development had key deadlines they had to hit key deadlines they had to meet and equally as an academic we're all aware you've grant deadlines you've uh, paper review deadlines you've marking deadlines and all of these things if there isn't enough um, space given between them uh, it can mean sort and things don't get done so there was a really nice relationship from the very start where things were flagged months in advance that we were going to target or let's say if if it clashed with um, a marking deadline or things like that that we we moved the targets around so that they were um they were more attainable and the other thing i suppose that working with cc bio as an academic has has really enlightened me too uh is i suppose the entrepreneurial spirit that um well i suppose it's awakened within me a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit and it's changed the way i look at an awful lot of my research now and it's changed the way i look at some uh research collaborations with respect to okay we we can do the publication we can um we can get the story out there but what's often overlooked particularly in my sphere which is in the discovery of novel antimicrobials is an academic will discover something publish it and that's that and there's no ip or there's no protection involved um and, and certainly working with cc bio has uh, opened my eyes to the importance of starting that process of potentially uh, putting some intellectual property uh protection around ideas that could be uh, commercially viable and starting that process very early so that it doesn't infringe on other key metrics such as the ability to publish the work or the ability to seek further funding for the work um and I think to to um, highlight that within Brunel, Brunel is, is actually um, really, really good at going through that process of supporting academics through the process of determining if what they're working on is does have commercial potential and then going through the next stages of how to actually uh, file a priority patent on that. And just to, I suppose we highlighted the Innovate UK grant, but just to highlight some of the other more recent achievements associated with it. So CC Bio went on to get uh, 
get a, a really nice investment in August of last year of £900,000 from a venture capitalist company. So again, it, it's really been, uh, it's springboarded their work. Um, I was kept happy because equally we've gotten a, a really nice publication which came out a couple of weeks ago on the technology that we developed in collaboration with CC Bio. And equally then we were invited to, to um, uh, I suppose the most high profile microbiology conference in the UK to actually talk about this work as well. So from an academic perspective, the, if the targets are set out quite clearly um, when collaborating with a, with a startup company, you can make sure that, that the deliverables that you get out of it uh, are equally as good um, or as beneficial um, as the deliverables that the startup company can start to achieve also. So that wraps up the, the talk. I'm happy to take any questions if anybody has any questions for myself or David. So, yeah, well, th thank you. That was a really interesting presentation and we didn't pay David to uh, say nice <laughs> things about our innovation <laughs> vouchers, but uh, it's noted. But I think it's it's. I think the points you raise and and you could so perhaps we'll pick some of these up in the discussion is actually there is a certain, there is funding around in RSDO to support these kinds of um, uh, enterprises and perhaps we don't not all academics are aware of it um, but I, I I want to go back to to the beginning David did I get it correctly that you kind of cold called some academics. Mm -hmm. to yeah, yeah, I suppose. We, we so I'm intrigued as to how did you decide who to cold call and how many replied? Um, <laughs> not too many, I suppose. And I, uh, what we what we looked for, and I, I guess uh, Ronan could probably comment on this a little bit more from his own perspective. But we looked for for academics who were quite active uh, in the space, uh, both both, you know, um, from a very formal or traditional publication uh, aspect, but also, you know, on on newer communication formats such as Twitter, et cetera, or, or you know, involved in, in events, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I think that's where Rodan came to our attention because he is quite, I would say, high profile and devotes the time to, I guess, those more modern ways of, of, of I guess, translating what can often be uh, obscure or, let's say, uh, yeah, not non-translatable research into 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 media that that everyone can understand. I think I think that was probably the criteria that we used to to reach out to these academics. And then I guess we just we just emailed them explaining where we were coming from, what we wanted to do. And I would say you know maybe twenty to thirty percent of them replied. But I suppose Ronan was was one yeah. of those who who was willing to engage in further discussion. So I think I think that's that's how it happened. Uh, really. Yeah. No, no, and I think your point about um finding <clears throat> excuse me people who are active in particular research areas using mm -hmm. these new new yeah, yeah. ways of promoting our research and what we do is, is really important particularly for academic dinosaurs like me who don't don't uh, don't uh, think twitter is a, a you know kind of a useful mechanism but yeah uh, well that's, that's just that's me but i think you know we yeah. we we do need to think about how we profile and present ourselves. It doesn't matter what I think. That's the way the world is, and we have to. We have yeah, to use it. and it and it, it mightn't. There mightn't be a metric that you know you can you can immediately get the a measurement of of the work that you're putting into something like that. You know, mm. I know Ronan uh, curates curates a, a Twitter page that that has quite a large following now about antimicrobial resistance, etc. And at times, you know, maybe that doesn't feed into the ref score. But I think the proof is in the pudding when you when you manage to pull in an, an industrial collaboration. So so I think that's something that universities can be open minded about. But what I would say is that Brunel in general are very open minded versus a lot of other universities that we have dealt with, uh, you know, in London or in, in the wider UK about about engaging with people like ourselves and making it a little bit easier to, to help those commercial collaborations get off the ground. So I wouldn't say that that uh, Brunel aren't wise to these sorts of things or no, that they it, aren't it's doing just it certain else. members of the community like me who, <laughs> but, uh, but certainly from um, the department of clinical sciences as well we've had some very profitable um uh mutually beneficial um developments from innovation vouchers from again mm -hmm. people cold calling academics who they yeah. think have yeah, they're really good to offer yeah so that, mm -hmm. that's really good 
Think yeah, just just to emphasize yeah. that point again, I think it's uh, as David said. I mean, they didn't just contact me; they contacted yeah. a bunch mm -hmm. of academics. And the fact that in Brunel we had that instrument that we could say, okay, well, th this is maybe going to make you make Brunel a bit more attractive than some of these other collaborating partners. Yeah. In yeah. that we we can offer this scheme. And I mean, the other thing that to remember with the innovation voucher is it is a funding call you need to submit an application it gets yeah. reviewed yeah. and equally then future funders and i know for a fact that innovate uk viewed it very favorably that we'd worked previously with cc bio we would gotten funding yeah. with cc bio and that we delivered on a grant so it, it almost de-risked our innovate uk proposal in Absolutely. the sense that we'd already demonstrated we'd worked with them um, so again, it, it's always any time I'm meeting companies and stuff like that. It's always something that I I try and work into the conversation that what we have this funding instrument that that can get you that little bit of pilot data that you might need for that bigger funding yeah. application. So yeah, it's a fantastic tool. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yes, with the gentleman. Yeah. This question. Yeah. Okay, so perhaps we can. Um, how how long have we got, Michael? Yeah, we've well, got well, another uh, form, a three to four minutes. I need one day to kind out. So. Uh, okay, so I guess perhaps um, it would be useful to spend our remaining time thinking about the response to a question that Catherine asked, which was about whether there's adequate provision in higher education to give researchers, so um, postgraduate doctoral students, Oh, doctoral researchers, sorry, get my language correct, and early career researchers, the kind of tools, knowledge and confidence to both approach groups, but also to respond to them. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I think I can't speak for the entire higher education sector, um, but I think at, at Brunel, we certainly work with um, our doctoral students, so there's a programme of training for doctoral students, which part of which is working with stakeholders, working with collaborators, how well it prepares them um, for the, I, I think it's, it can only introduce them to the principles and, and the practice probably. And to some degree, it depends upon the projects where Doctoral research, doctoral researchers are, are working on. I know we, we RSDO, you are quite involved in in some of that 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 training. But it is, I would say, it's a bit ad hoc. Um, and and as we and as we and as you can see from the talks from um, Gabriella, but also from from Ronan. You know, there, there, and and from and from Dan. You know, there there are small pots of money around the university, so the innovate vouchers that we can use, and I suspect that quite a few colleagues are not aware of them. So I think mm -hmm. it's a work in progress, um, mm -hmm. and any any feedback on how we can do it better, gratefully received. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or, 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 or uh, thank you, Christina. From the from the speaker's point of view, Christina was mentioning earlier from especially our non non academic uh, uh, stakeholders here. Do you have any insights to share yeah. with us? Yeah. In a what? How, uh, how? Yes. How we could strengthen the skills yes. in in yeah, here? How can we do better in terms of you know or first uh, to all our uh, you know collaborators and then to to uh, Brunel staff on the panel? So yes. Responding to Catherine's question. Yeah. Benjamin or Ian, would you like to start and then uh, uh, David coming in later? How can we strengthen that skill building for for collaboration uh, uh, with policymakers, with businesses, and and others uh, in 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 university setup like Brunel? Um, it's hard. Well, uh, well, my first thought is that you seem to be doing really well at it already um, from, from a very much outside perspective um, uh, and, and, and not being an academic myself and we have a couple of relationships with other uh, other universities who on, on a couple of research um, bits but certainly this uh, this relationship has been far and away the most uh, rewarding engaging um, uh, um, and um, sort of professional um, one that we've had so again a hard hard to comment um i mean if you do have any sort of um uh 
sort of protocols or anything like that, I'd be more than happy to sort of take time and to uh, read, review, and and, and comment on. Um, but again, in in in, in just a, I'm not doing very well here, but in, in in from from our relationship, it's been brilliant. From uh, from listening to the other two 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 um, presentations, it, clearly things have gone extremely well, and and you've been extremely uh, um uh successful um so yeah it's not an answer uh, I'm, I'm afraid uh, or not a helpful one but i don't know if ian or others have got any 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 other any other thoughts or comments um i would just think i mean in our case the request came to the right person at the civic center at the yeah. right time um and i got back in from my management team to obviously be involved um yeah i think it's just hitting excuse the phrase contacting or getting in touch with the right person right. from the organization yeah. that you want yes. assistance yes. with yes um yeah. that's passionate about what they do yeah yeah thank so you a bit, uh, a bit uh, pot luck unfortunately michael yes <laughs> yeah and david you already you have any, any further things to add there david very briefly otherwise uh, yeah no just i guess i guess to reiterate reiterate what ian said there i think trying to get the right person in place more often is is uh, is useful so i suppose from our perspective we came out of a venture creation house there's plenty of them in the uk now or in london or plenty of competitions where young startups are are entering if you identify those those startups and get people from brunel at those startups and make the make the uh, at those competitions and make the startups aware that stuff like innovation vouchers exist you know i'd say that that increases the chances that the right person will 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 be in touch uh in at the right time so i think stuff like that being a bit more proactive might might be might be something that that brunel could do okay thank you uh very insightful coming to dan gabriela and ronan in, in 30 seconds because we have already all gone about the time so very briefly on this point please I go first. Um, right, right. Oh, Dan, 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 you you are muted, so feel free to go first if you like. Okay. Did you say I'm not muted? You can hear me, right? No, you are unmuted. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I can hear you. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. Thirty seconds. Yes. Uh, yeah. I feel like I've got some great colleagues around Brunel. I've always known that uh, all over the university. We've always felt very collegiate. Um, and uh, yeah, long may that continue. So I know who to go to at Brunel to help me to um, facilitate such um, partnerships. And uh, I, I certainly did work off my own back as well. I, I think I explained that, that I was kind of strategic in my thinking that uh, I wanted my research to have some impact out there. And I'm, I'm just so glad to be a part of this project. But yeah, Bell Goman has been great. And uh, I've worked with you before, Michael, as well. And you've been very responsive too and tried to open doors as well, even though they didn't always uh, lead somewhere. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Gabriela. Yeah, I'll go next. Um, it is interesting how you make contacts today that might come back useful in two years' time, and 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 that is the network that you are able to build up. Um, I have to say, with regards to the first point on early career research and PhD students to be helped in identify relevance and impact, I think is down also to. The relationship that they have with their mentor, line manager, supervisor, whoever is the person that they ref they have a reference with, or they refer to. Um, and I think in my case, for example, Tim has been exceptional in getting to know the organisation. Uh, in this particular case, the trusts that he was working with, making contact with the manufacturers, understand what they needed, and trying to find synergy between needs. And finding synergy between needs also means finding synergies between responses. Um, with regards to opening doors, I think is um, there is one thing that lead to another. Certainly, RSDO has been um, exceptional in supporting. I want to mention Hitesh, who was the person actually that mentioned the AHRC uh, call that we applied and won. <clears throat> And uh, prior to that, you know, all started with our work being exhibited at Design for Health exhibition at Guy and St Thomas and being spotted by the head of nursing, a very senior uh, person in Guy and St Thomas that said, we want that at the trust. So um, there is a little bit of serendipity taking on, taking place, but certainly you have to work on your own back in order to identify who to speak with because you never know. 
Thank you, Gabriela. Ronan? Yeah, just just to wrap up, I think I think there is a, a really nice drive um, among particularly the undergraduate cohort and certainly uh, doctoral researchers to engage them more with innovation and, and thinking about startup or, or becoming an entrepreneur as a genuine career path. And uh, I'll certainly be helped in that endeavour by people coming back, entrepreneurs coming back and speaking to the students. And I think David has been one of those entrepreneurs who's come back and, and sparked some excitement among our undergraduate cohort about genuinely being an entrepreneur as a career choice as soon as you finish university or as soon as you finish your um, uh, uh, PhD. Um, in terms of opening doors, I mean, Michael, you, you've you've been instrumental in that on a number of occasions in terms of when inquiries come in. You, you, you've directed a couple of to me, um, which some have, have yielded benefits, some haven't, but it's always good that I think the right conversations have been have, had. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's all good. Thank you, everyone. Uh, exciting. Over to Christina for the concluding take home take home <laughs> message so, for us. I guess our take home message is on both sides of these partnerships. We need to be able to find the right person at the right time. And as a and as an institution, we need to think about perhaps making it easier for people to find external partners to find the right people within Brunel. Yes. Thank you. That's a real pearl yeah. of wisdom. Summarizing <laughs> everything we've discussed. Thank you, Christina. Fab it's been fabulous. Thank you to all the speakers. Yeah. It's been really, really good. Thank you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know that you can see some uh, electronic uh, approaches coming <laughs> there. We can't make any yeah. sound there. So really want to say thank you to all our speakers. And uh, I know I, there was one agenda in terms of announcements. I just want to say we have a new program in Brunel Initiate called RIME. That's Research, Innovate and Emerge, targeting businesses and SMEs and charities and third sector organizations for it's strengthening their ability for collaborative research and innovation. And I had a slide, but no time. I put the link. Yeah. So again, from local authority point of view, Ian, if you want to promote this in Hillington area, we have already supported around 25 organizations, majority of them from West London, also Benjamin in your network and other colleagues here, please do promote because we want these organizations to strengthen their ability for collaborative research and innovation and also availing instruments like innovation voucher or things like that you know so so and overall since 2017 it uh, we started we have helped organization to get almost two million out of this uh, five thousand pounds worth of innovation vouchers so these are businesses you know gaining not us so so yes in con concluding that so I'm getting excited so thank you everybody yeah. and also to our discussion who, who actually yeah. initiated this this uh, thinking for us yes yeah and th and the recording will be available on the research festival website yes and thank you Seb, for doing thank everything you. behind thank the scenes thank you Seb. yeah yes yeah thank you thank you thank you christina and michael thank you thanks Ian. thanks benjamin thank you thanks very much thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all.